Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. We're here today to talk about what is on the minds of Asia giants. We're basically talking about what are the main issues that are preoccupying the leaders of the Asian and Chinese regions right now. And I'm joined on the stage by Dick Fold. He's chairman and chief executive officer of Lehman Brothers with an extensive uh, operation in those regions in addition to the United States. Nandan Nicolani is chief executive officer and managing director at Infosys Technologies. Azim Premji is chairman of Wipro in India. And Edward S. Tian, vice chairman of China Netcom Group, People's Republic of China. First off, gentlemen, let's talk about human capital and what you all are seeing in terms of um, attracting talent to your companies. I suspect this is one of the biggest issues that you are all faced with and uh, are somewhat concerned with. Nandan. Well, I think uh, we are seeing a period of high growth in India where India is growing at 8 percent a year in many, many industries. And this is creating a serious shortage of uh, ca human capital. And I think companies are trying to respond by creating a great brand for attracting employees, by investing in employees. For example, at Infosys, we're building the world's largest corporate university, investing $300 million to train 13,500 people at one time. So I think in general, people are working very hard to attract, retain, and, and, and keep the people with themselves. And I think that's going to be an increasing challenge as the country continues to grow at this pace. And uh, I want to broaden it out and really ask you straight off, really, what are the main issues that are concern, concerning um, Indian and, uh, and Chinese executives today? But, but let's stay on this idea of, of talent. And, Dick, um, you, tell me what you see in terms of uh, uh, attracting talent today. I mean, aren't we all faced with um, this enormous inflow of money into private equity firms and the idea that so many talented people, whether it's on the MBA level or the CEO level, actually are looking to private equity and, and hoping to, to work there, and, and perhaps um, uh, that is a negative for, for some of the companies up here. Well, that's a whole different, different topic. That's not necessarily just, just limited to either China or India. <clears throat> that question is more about regulation and do those that are running public companies want to migrate more to the private space. Uh, it's about boards. It's about Sarbanes-Oxley. It's about documentation. Uh, it's about putting yourself on the line for signing. And my, my bet is it's also going to lead to executive compensation. But the issues that we're talking about here are much more about about retention. Uh, I think it's easy to hire in both China and India, but it's not so easy to keep these best people, whether it's about a competitor, uh, whether it's about a new startup where they get large amounts of equity, or even, as you would say, the private equity firms where they need talented people uh, to, to staff these, these new companies that are coming out of the public arena, spend two or three years in transition. But for all these private equity deals that come out of the public arena, the private equity firms still have to monetize them some way and get them back into the public markets to find real value. For us, we're finding that we're losing anywhere between 25 to 30 percent of our people on a constant basis turnover. It's a real issue for us. Azim, let me take a step back and ask you to outline some of the uh, challenges uh, entrepreneurs in India today face in terms of taking their businesses global. You know, I, I think uh, with the liberalization which we have had over the past 15 years, and particularly over the past five years, most markets in India have got extremely globalized. So the kind of competition you face in India today is not necessarily of a dimension which is too different than the kind of competition you face in global markets, which is why Indian companies are increasingly becoming more successful in global markets. I think the unique thing about global markets for an Indian company is its ability to localize well in global markets and be able to source and retain talent and integrate it into the whole system given the fact that so many companies are predominantly Indian. And that this does not mean at uh, operating level, it also means at an executive level. 
that's the biggest challenge we face, and we face it increasingly in terms of uh, doing successful jobs in the acquisitions which we do, and we have done seven global acquisitions in the past 12 months, and we intend to do more. But we learn from it, and uh, we build up methodologies to be able to do it reasonably successfully. <laughs> but the challenge still remains in the softer aspects of it, the softer aspects of the integration. And Edward, how does that differ um, from what you're seeing in the landscape in China? I think uh, probably face uh, the issue more serious is the uh, language issues. When India, com India company go to <coughs> global, English is uh, not a barrier. But for most the Chinese company, when they go to global, language probably is the number one challenge in different level. Very few Chinese large company CEO can speak uh, fluent in English, and uh, the working level is a similar problem. And secondly, you know, most large Chinese company we see is stay on enterprises. When they go to global, they're facing the different pay scheme. And uh, when you go to global, you have to hire the people pay locally. Very often case, probably the branch manager's salary in United States are higher than CEO of headquarters. So those kind of challenges is quite unique for China. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a, a different um, situation because really India is is a bottom up um, economy versus China being top down. Isn't that right, Nandan? Yeah. Well, I think uh, that's been the unique feature that we have a lot of entrepreneurs who have come up uh, in the system, and I think. You know, we've gone through a period when we had very big state controls on business to a point when controls got loosened up to a point in the 90s when Indian companies learned to deal with global competition in India. And finally, this decade, they're all going out and making acquisitions. So I think there's been a steady progression in the revolution. And therefore, you have a much larger number of companies across many diverse industries who are now confident to go out. And I think that's the unique feature that they really all come up from the ranks in some sense and our bottom-up stories. And, and Dick, this is a, a big opportunity for your firm, really, because uh, these companies need a lot in terms of uh, expertise, building these businesses, risk control. <laughs> Tell us a little about the services that you have been able to offer and why this is such a big opportunity for Lehman Brothers. Well, it's very interesting. I, I, I'm actually blessed with the, with the simplicity and ignorance of an outsider's view, so I'm uh, but when you think about the concerns of the both Indian and Chinese businessmen, they have a lot of the same concerns, whether it's the world economy, which is their own home economy, or, unfortunately, the importance of the U.S. economy. And so one of the things we can bring to them is the understanding of the world economies and the interrelationship of the world economies. What's interesting today, though, when you think about the electronic connectivity of the markets today, investors have the right and also the capability to move their capital to the highest returning asset. And part of our job is to get our clients in a position of credibility where we educate our global investors around the world to be willing to accept the responsibility of placing capital in those regions. That's about corporate governance. It's about transparency. Uh, it's about a global workforce, all the, all the things we were talking about before. It's about financing, access to capital, financial products, whether it's about uh, securitization, hedging, making sure that those clients have the ability to transfer the risk from their balance sheets to others. Then there's some specific risks that both India uh, and Chinese businessmen have, whether it's around pollution, Water. Water is a huge issue for both of them. Uh, then there's some, spe some, some specific business risk. Both of them are low-end manufacturers, both end low-end producers. They're being challenged by other people in the region. But China clearly is 
driven by state-owned enterprises, and India is driven much more by the private sector, and that, that has created a variety of different problems also. Right. There, there are so many issues, and we want to we wanna go one by one. Azim, let me ask you this. Why don't you follow up on Dick's comments and tell us a little about how you have reshaped your business to best operate on the global stage in terms of corporate governance, in terms of addressing some of the issues that he brings up. Yeah, but I think part of the issues on corporate governance really gets addressed uh, by the fact that you do a foreign listing. I mean, that puts enough back pressure into the system to get you online on most issues. So I don't think in terms of operating in a global market or operating in the Indian market, issues on corporate governance are any different, really. I mean, the standards are high. And if you want to position yourself as a company, generally vis-a-vis uh, -vis the investors and vis-a-vis -vis your partners and suppliers, as a company of high corporate governance, it falls uniformly across global and domestic markets. I don't think there's anything unique about it. You just have to maintain very high standards and constantly work at uplifting those standards. Edward, do you have challenges in terms of uh, reshaping the business uh, regarding corporate governance? Tell us about your business. I think most of the Chinese company has a huge challenge on that because most of the large listed company was government-owned. And there used to be you, you know, work just for government. And now through the public listing, you have to transfer 100% stay on the enterprises into the public listed company. That transaction process is pretty painful. And uh, even currently still, you know, the, the probably more than a dozen the larger companies already listed. But most of the company government still on the 75% of, of the company. So government still the largest shareholder. How can you build the good corporate governance, uh, corporate governance, when you have a major government shareholder. I think compared to a few years ago, we already made a lot of progress, and the capital market played a major role to help China company being more transparent. But uh, I still think a lot of challenges ahead of us. The CNC, we used to be 100% on the government. Two years ago, we listed in New York and Hong Kong. Through that process, we have independent board directors. We build a couple of communities on the board. Now we have every quarterly you know, board meeting. But uh, I, my question is uh, how much is uh, you know, substance of corporate governance? How much is uh, appearance? And uh, I think it's still a very difficult question. We have a long way to go. Dick, do you want to add to, to uh, those comments as far as how you might help or businessmen who might be in a different place might be able to assist in getting to the next level? Because, you know, what we've just heard is that it's, it, it, from Edward is, is that this has been quite painful. Well, it's clearly been painful for them because they have been so heavily dominated by the state-owned enterprises. But I must tell you, we have some of those same problems in the U.S., the difference between substance and perception. Uh, as a matter of fact, recently there was a little piece with Bloomberg, Schumer, and Spitzer saying I'm talking about the shift of business away from New York, away from the U.S., to other regions, most, most notably London. But there, is, there are a whole series of issues in China, per se, uh, whether it's around protection of intellectual property, whether it's around licensing from, from the state-owned enterprises and then, then from the government, what the government will allow you to do, whether it's around the ability to attract outside capital, whether it's around uh, understanding listing requirements, balance sheet requirements, understanding of credit, non-performing loans, still a huge issue. And is there an integrated banking system that can handle that? But what's really interesting and what I'm hearing, one of the biggest issues for China is the migration of the next 400 million people to commerce. And how will the Chinese government handle that migration 
will they be able to put in the resources and infrastructure before those people wake up either because of the internet or cell phone and find out what other opportunities are available to them before the government has those capabilities in place. And so when you talk about access to capital, investors are worried about that. Now, we're working with a lot of the Chinese companies to try to wall off sections of that uh, to bring credibility to specific companies. As a matter of fact, we actually just created a joint venture with IBM. Uh, we're we're going to put capital into companies in China uh, specifically to uh, to put in technology infrastructure to get them to a place where they can then lay in the necessary corporate governance pieces. You know, it seems it's a huge that, challenge. Nandan, it seems like the uh, Indian companies are looking um, a little more, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, opportunistic as opposed to the Chinese companies. It just seems that there's more um, aggressiveness in terms of not only competing um, in their own home, but actually in, uh, competing for, 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 with foreign companies. How do you see this? You mean you're saying uh, India, the Indian companies are more... Uh Aggressive or – yeah, no, I think so. I think, as I said, uh, you know, India's major liberalization happened in the 90s. And when it first happened, there was a lot of apprehension among Indian businesses that this opening up the, of the economy and allowing foreign players would, would swamp them. But I think a lot of them gained a lot of confidence in the 90s. They, they really tightened up. They made their companies more efficient. They, they learned to deal with competitors in their own market. So I think that has given tremendous confidence. And also the fact that there, there's, a high growth economy, uh, there's a high growth economy, which in turn means that companies are growing rapidly, is generating the cash flow and the profits for them to seek uh, international acquisitions. So I think uh, that's the reason you're seeing in a variety of industries, in, in steel, in, in automobiles, in, in forgings, in, in, of course in technology, but now it's gone beyond technology. I think uh, the willingness to go out. And I think also the fact that uh, culturally there's a lot of, uh, you know, people are comfortable with English, they're comfortable with global business practices. I think they have the, the confidence to go out and, and buy companies or to, or to set up uh, offices across the world and sell. Dick made a comment earlier before we may, came in the room that, you know, um, where ba the, um, the banking system in China um, needs to get further reformed and the infrastructure is in place, but it's the opposite in India where the infrastructure really needs to uh, come along a lot more. Tell me what kind of a challenge that has been, Azim, the infrastructure issues. You know, sometimes I think this whole thing is getting blown out of proportion. Uh, you know, let's just go by segment by segment. You know, I think in terms of a telecommunication infrastructure, we're probably equal to the best in the world. In terms of reliability, we have far more reliable wireless connections in India than most parts of Europe and certainly America. And costs which are probably half that uh, of most of America. Uh, so far as... Uh, <clears throat> I would not take, by the way, the U.S. telecom infrastructure <laughs> as the basis for any measurement at all. <laughs> That's right. So you make, you make my point. When I, when I go from my building to the West Side Drive, yeah. <laughs> which is about seven blocks away, I lose connectivity four times. <laughs> Outside of that, we're doing pretty well. <laughs> That's right. You know, if, if you look at our civil aviation, you know, I think we have extremely healthy, extremely competitive, extremely high customer service oriented, and very low cost airlines. Uh, and multiple people are entering, and it's very competitive. And now you're seeing that privatization happening in airports across the board and, and starting to happen even in second-level cities. And I think you're going to see a similar wave happening in seaports. Uh, I find that particularly over the past year and a half, some of the new initiatives of our government on uh, public-private partnerships and uh, uh, pricing models and uh, collaboration models they have worked out on road construction has started suddenly attracting a lot of investment from overseas, particularly investments of, of course, Indian entrepreneurs, which of a fairly large scale, but also of uh, Far Eastern entrepreneurs, Malaysian entrepreneurs, Singapore entrepreneurs, and uh, entrepreneurs particularly from Dubai. So I'm... I'm uh, optimistic that in road constructions, including city roads and highways, you will see 
a significant step up in improvements. I think our problem remains areas like water management, which I think is the most serious, which is completely getting neglected even today. And power management, uh, where because of the legacy of state governments and central governments, we've not got a proper integration between the two. But a recent initiative launched by uh, the government in terms of setting up special purpose vehicles, where everything is taken care of and their special purpose vehicle is then auctioned. Uh, it's, it's met with recent success. And if that model is well replicated, uh, I think it can give some fillip to investments in power going forward. But the most serious issue, as I see it, is going to remain water management. It's getting completely neglected. And that's an issue for the Chinese companies as well. China, I mean, our infrastructure is woefully behind though, with most uh, Far Eastern countries. I, I don't think there's any apology for that. China certainly built a you know, pretty good infrastructure last 10 years. The challenge for China, how can we build the, the global you know, a competitive uh, company like uh, India, particularly on the technology side. If we look at today, top 10 Chinese companies globally, probably mostly all of them are state-owned. But uh, you, if we look at the uh, you know, next layer, in the last 10 years since uh, you know, private uh, business introduced to China, we see very vibrant entrepreneurs. They are starting building their business, particularly they build a business model based on internet as a new platform. So in the last uh, uh, five years, more than a dozen Chinese internet companies listed in NASDAQ. All those companies right now is still a little bit small. Market cap are probably two billion to three billion, even less than that. But all those companies start with nothing. And they build a pretty, and then with good idea and the products, very often, in, in, uh, you know, uh, have Western type of venture capital invested and uh, grow very, very fast. So we see those kind of company, I believe, in the next five or ten years, will become of 10 billion, maybe 15 billion dollar. Those companies will represent future Chinese multinationals. And so I think our future probably we will see two categories of Chinese company. Steer large infrastructure type, type of company, oil, telecom, maybe airline, state control. And uh, they have certain you know, state support, but also have a lot of you know, challenges. We also can see high growth com you know, very high growth company, particularly internet-based technology companies. I think those companies in the next five years, give them time with a large population of China and a very interesting business model has been created. Even, you know, the business model we haven't seen in the United States, like, a, you know, online game industry become very, very interesting in China. And we see those, uh, you know, like Jack Ma is here, Alibaba, he's creating, uh, you know, one of kind uh, internet uh, uh, conglomerates doing internet portal, e-commerce, and uh, you know pay, payment system. I think those companies in the you know, next five to ten years could be very big, and there could be you know new type of Chinese multinational can compete globally. How open would you say are those industries to um, to foreigners? I mean, clearly the market in, in China and the market in India has been so attractive to foreign companies, American companies in particular, wanting a, a piece of that enormous population. Which industries do you think are, are open to that? And what do you want from, say, American uh, executives? Is it, look, don't call us, we'll call you when we're ready, or is it we, we want to see more competition? In infrastructure side, you know, by end of this year, the foreigners can own up to 50% the, the Chinese fixed line and the mobile operator. And challenging for foreign operator is most of Chinese operators are already very big. It's hard to own, you know, big chunk of that is going to be very expensive. China Mobile already in terms of market cap is the world's largest uh, mobile company. Uh, internet, uh, you know, is, is very open. You know, most of, you know, publicly listed company, they have some of those legal structure, basically can be 100% foreign owned. But a successful one, very often is local entrepreneur combined with the foreign capital. I think uh, growing next five to six years, China will still going to be a technology importer country. 
I think a lot of you know the basic technology will still very much rely on the United States, Japan, maybe India. I think uh, you know innovation going to be challenging for us, and uh, this is why you know most of Chinese entrepreneur and including government begin to you know recognize one thing is intellectual property you know protections, another thing is innovation. We have to become, you know, we, made, we have to change ourselves from made in China into the invented in China. I think we're going to, you know, it's going to be a long way, but I think uh, innovation technology is going to be still the major demand from international. Let me get all of your thoughts on, on what, if anything, would slow things down. It seems that the numbers in terms of growth have been so stunning in both regions. What do you worry about that perhaps could put a wrench in things? Well, I think uh, in, in India we have a lot of internal challenges. I mean, I think the fact is that while there is rapid economic growth, it's not universally distributed, and uh, there are income disparities which are coming because of that. There are urban-rural disparities coming. There are north-south disparities coming. So I think uh, it's a lot of that has to do with the politics of the situation. And if, if the politics of the situation worsens in the sense that people don't feel that they are getting a piece of this economic growth, then certainly that could be uh, something which would retard the progress. Similarly, on a global front too, if there, is, if there are traces of protectionism where as Asian companies look at expanding and you know, buying companies and so forth, if there's any kind of uh, protectionism backlash on that, I think that could potentially retard that. So I think it's on the external front, it would be some form of uh, protectionism and on the Inside India, it's really about whether you can create a model of growth that is inclusive and therefore everybody is on the bandwagon of growth. Dick? Actually, you wrote an interesting article yourself uh, where you talked about protectionism and pollution. Those are real the two, two threats. I, I thought so. I agreed with you. Uh, <laughs> but clearly it's geopolitical risk to me is always... It's outside geopolitical risk. It's inside social imbalance. Uh, in both countries, uh, it's, it's, it's matching the balance between creating an infrastructure for those that have money versus trying to create an infrastructure that though, that for those that don't have money yet. For China, it's trying to create deregulation in a centralized economy. Uh, for India, it's all of what my partner just outlined. But it's but it's 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 how do you balance? I mean, in these in these two countries, you have two and a half billion people. India has a huge middle class of in excess of three hundred middle p three hundred million middle class. As I said before, China has to get the next four hundred million up and running into, into, into commerce. But it's about securing natural resources, creating national supply chains. It's about infrastructure throughout the country. It's about energy. Uh, and the list goes on. I mean, any, any one of those things, terrorism, threat of, ter threat of terrorism, social unrest, pandemic events, water, uh, climate change, which all of us have been talking about. That's not just going to affect those two countries. It will affect all of us. But any, any, any one of those things can be game changers. You've all mentioned water. Let's talk a little about that. You know, Edward, I, uh, why don't you talk to us a little about this issue of pollution? How worried are you that the water quality and pollution in the air is going to uh, stunt growth in any way, or what is the impact? Well, if you look at my background, actually I get my education on environmental science. So I worry about this issue greatly. The challenge is uh, the country like China, with that such size, they want to start both industrialize, uh, industrialize themselves, also build the information industry. It's a very, really serious issues. One way I'm thinking about China should build a new business model. And uh, this is why information technology is so important. We should build the, the economy based on the 
information system make a whole economy more efficient rather than build the, the economy based on the energy. So, uh, you know, I'm a person promote that. That's why I think uh, the great information, uh, telecommunication infrastructure is very important. E-commerce is very important. New type of, you know, interactive, you know, advertisement. We consume the inventory tremendously. And uh, alternative technology is, is very, very important. You know, every day you think you top, the, I think last year, the Chinese media did a survey about the number one issues for, for them. And the environment issue become, you know, uh, ranked to uh, number two or number three. I think this issue can become bigger become, before we can solve it. How serious do you think the government is in terms of its approach? Government try to make a lot of effort on that. I think the challenging for government is really for the, the balance. And uh, the steer 200, uh, 200 million uh, Chinese steer, you know, on the rural side with a very low level uh, income, and it's hard for those kind of people sacrifice their only income, which is selling certain natural resources or water resources, just to make a living or, you know, send children to school. I think government put a lot of resources on that, and my own view is the public government alone is not enough. This issue really needs to be resolved with uh, you know, academic research, non-government organization, and uh, this is going to be probably take China maybe a decade or so to begin to solve this problem, because we see that Japan went through a similar situation in the 50s, 60s. Nandan? Well, uh, well, I think clearly environment is, is a big issue, but I think the challenge is how do, how do you do it in isolation with, with, without a global system? Because I think, uh, uh, you know, it's, there is going to be a lot of uh, environmental issues because, a, for example, the number of cars sold in India today is about 1 million, and it's going to go up to 3 million cars in, in 4 to 5 years. Uh, there, every, every, there are a lot of new coal-based coal plants coming up which are going to add to the carbon emission. So I think the, the, the question is what is the system that we create to incentivize these people who make cars or these people who build plants to, to reduce, reduce the impact on the environment. Similarly on water, you know, there's a lot of urban growth with, with very poor water supply, very contaminated water. I think that's a big challenge. On the rural side, because you're growing crops which involve water intensive crops which, for which there's firm procurement, you're distorting, you know, the use of water in agriculture. So there are a lot of challenges of that type. But I think there is an awareness, but the reality is that I don't think politicians can say we'll, we'll slow down growth for the people on the grounds of environment. And therefore, I think we have to come up with a much better macro global solution to this where you reward individuals or companies that invest in, 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 in conservation or invest in a reduction of emission. And for that, we really need a much better global system to make the you know, incentives and disincentives work. In fact, there is a, an enormous amount of money going into finding solutions to these issues um, throughout America and really the world. Dick, what do you think? Do you think that's an investment opportunity for foreigners to see what needs to be done in terms of um, finding solutions for the water problem, the, the pollution problem in China and India? And, and do you think we'll see more foreigners try to put their money toward finding solutions? Well, with, with any set of, set of challenges, there always comes a set of opportunities. Uh, but these are huge infrastructure projects. Uh, and for those that are involved in those projects, clearly it's, a, it's an opportunity. But I think when you think about uh, converting polluted water supplies or protecting against climate control issues, I think most people consider that today, except those that are directly involved with either the, the technology or the generating capability, most people consider that just an outright expense. Do you agree? Azim? Yes, so, so what precisely is your question? Well, I'm asking about poor, m new money coming in to try to find solutions to the, to the water issue and the pollution issue. Um, do you find that, that we could see this becoming an, uh, an opportunity for foreign money coming in? Well, I think certainly an opportunity, but I just see 
very little organized framework to attract it or very or any organized framework to direct it. You know, like it's happening in power, for instance. There's an organized framework, or at least an organized framework is going to fall in place to attract foreign investments into power. I'm not seeing that happening at all in power, which is quite surprising. It just seems to be on nobody's priority. Or if it is, maybe I'm just missing it. Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting, what's interesting in power, most of the conversation has been centered around coal-fired generation. In the U.S., about 50 percent of what we're doing is 50 percent of our electricity generating comes from coal. In the U.S., they're trying to set standards that are based on two things. One is clean emissions, and the second is either storage or sequestration of CO2. That's all well and good, except there's no technology for the latter. And so if we put in mandates that say you can't build new power plants unless you have the ability to sequester CO2 or store and store safely, you can't build new power plants. That will be a problem. And so unfortunately, some of the regulations are being set or at least thought of without a full deck of information. And until there is a full deck, I don't think you're going to get people to invest uh, with any thought of getting a return without that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Edward? I think another problem for this infrastructure project, you, very often is the utility and government we are reg regulated uh, how much you can charge. I agree with as One way is uh, there's no framework around that. And uh, so that's probably the issue. And uh, another thing is probably the new alternative technology because, the, you know, uh, China is a situation if everything we do follow U.S. model, there's no way China can develop itself meanwhile maintain reasonable environmental uh, standard. We have to find a new technology. We have to find an alternative way to develop our country meanwhile maintain reasonable good ecosystem. Mm -hmm. This is why I think the new technology, new ideas, new business model are extremely important in China. Mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting. We've, we've spoken about a number of challenges and opportunities that you all face, and it seems like very often we keep coming back to this idea of, of talent, retention of talent, attracting talent. Um, is this, do you think, the most important issue that we ought to be discussing, Nandan? Well, uh, well, certainly I think, uh, certainly for a firm like Al, which is really about human capital, it is probably one of the biggest, impo most important issues, attracting, retaining, empowering, you know, energizing people, I think is really at the heart of what we're trying to create. Mm -hmm. So how do you do it? Oh, I think uh, we do lots of things on that. I think you know, we've we built a brand as the best employer in India. We're investing hugely in training. We're investing hugely in creating a culture of where people have a sense of meritocracy, where there's a very good system of rewarding them for good performance and, and penalizing them for not so good performance. So I think there's a whole – it's, it's, a, it's a creating a company with a purpose so that people feel they're part of that purpose. So I think there's a lot of things that one can do to create a climate where employees feel wanted, want to work, feel energized, and want to stay with you. In some cases, you're operating as a global company, obviously, but you have to operate locally. Oh, absolutely. And I think this is one of the challenges that Asian companies will face, which is as they globalize, the nature of the workforce will also globalize. They'll become far more multicultural. They'll become far more diverse. And I think the trick for them will be to marry some set of global values, which are universal, with some kind of localization so that they reflect the culture of the countries where they operate. And I think that's the big challenge that both Indian and Chinese companies will face as they globalize. Jay, can you talk a little about that? You clearly face the same because you're a global company trying to operate in, in several local economies. Well, clearly, as I said before, we've lost anywhere between, on an annual turnover, between 25 and 30 percent. Uh, what we have done to think about combating that uh, is to give all of our Indian employees stock in the company. And so far that seems to be working a little bit better so that they feel that they're more a part of the firm uh, 
actually a third of Lehman Brothers is owned by our employees, so I want them to feel the culture, to feel the glue, and to feel that they're, that they're part of the team. I think that's actually made a big difference. Uh, but you mentioned before in facing some of the, some of the problems, uh, what, would be, what would be interesting on some of these issues, and Edward talked about a little bit, unfortunately it's a little bit of a competition between U.S. and China. We both have the same problem in coal-fired generation. This would be one place to me where the two of us should get together, combine our research dollars instead of each trying to come up with a new wheel uh, because both of us clearly have to find ways to sequester CO2. Uh, nobody has it, and this would be an interesting place to see if we could put the best brains together, come up with best practices, and find a way at least to create a closer link. Strangely enough, that would also help us. Uh, and if we found similar projects with other countries, that would help us in this whole retention issue also. There's, there's, there's too much of I'm a contract player, I'm a mercenary, and I go to the highest bidder. I think all of us, all of us on this panel, would like to wipe that mentality away. Mm -hmm. And yet... You know, as these economies grow and and people are being getting richer, it's putting more pressure on the environment. People are buying more cars. You're seeing. I mean, that's why you have you know Indian companies buying oil fields in in Siberia. I mean, you're you're seeing this um, recognition that you better do something. Nandan. Yeah. No. No. I think uh, certainly. I think uh, one of the challenges will be commodities, resources, and as you said, uh, countries growing at 8% a year will definitely create a lot more demand for products, which in turn will create demand for commodities. And certainly one of the strategy of resource companies is to try to essentially, you know, buy assets outside, which will give them a assured source of resources. But I think that's just one part of it. I mean, it, that applies to oil companies or steel companies are looking at ore and stuff like that. But I think there's a much broader thing which is happening in technology, biotechnology, you know, in, in healthcare, pharmacy, in, in steel, in forgings, in automotive. So I think in, across the board, in different industries, I think com in company in India are globalizing, and resources is just one part of that quilt of uh, companies. Mm -hmm. Azim, give me your sense of what the Indian economy will look like in five years. Where will the dynamic industries be? What do you see as, as still laggard? You know, just a couple of overview comments. I think uh, the fundamentals of the Indian economy are very much in place. Uh, and I think uh, we've had the benefit of fairly sound economic management at a political uh, level uh, right through changes of government. We've typically had ministries which deal with uh, finance, uh, commerce, industry, and such commercial ministries uh, led by competent bureaucrats and led by competent politicians. So I have a huge amount of faith in the fundamental strength of the Indian economy. I think it's perfectly feasible for us to grow at 8% plus per year uh, at a compound annual growth rate over the next five years. And uh, that's sustainable. <coughs> uh, I think uh, the other thing which I'm finding, and you know, we have a very large stake in the domestic IT Indian business, in the business in India is a huge step up in ambition level and confidence level of Indian entrepreneurs. I think it was basically uh, driven by the software industry uh, where uh, many of the leading software companies were able to build very ambitious presence in global markets and quite successfully. To, uh, quite successfully. And that basically set an example to a lot of other entrepreneurs who figured that if these fools in software can do it, so can we. And I'm finding this happening industry across industry. And you're seeing this in the spate of investments which are going on, uh, the spate of acquisitions which are going on. If anything, I think uh, it, will, it will accelerate. It will not decelerate. And it's based on fairly conservative financing. So it's, you know, it's not based on hot air or people over-leveraging a lot of these acquisitions and growths. They've just managed their balance sheets tighter. They've managed their working capital better. They have reasonably high profitability. They're squeezing out more productivity from their fixed assets. And they're, they're financing some of these acquisitions and growths uh, reasonably well-balanced. Mm 
Hmm? I think one of the problems of the financial institutions is they are not borrowing enough from them. Edward, how do you see the Chinese economy, say, in five years? Five years is very hard to predict China in five years. And, uh, but a couple of thinking, I think the, you know, I think a lot of technology company, particularly entrepreneur lead technology company will grow, you know, much bigger. And uh, one example we, I can see that is uh, based on Chinese culture, the Taiwan is example. And uh, a lot of uh, Taiwanese company has started their business in the 70s, and now some, you know, most of them become very powerful globally. And uh, the next five years, I still believe the state owned enterprises will still command, um, you know, many uh, industry and uh, not serious uh, changing taking place. And finance market will become healthier. You know, the, the last uh, few years, the capital market, the particular stock market, become more efficient, more transparent, and the debt market start to you know build up, and um, you will see private equity and venture capital are become very active in China, and the uh, Chinese company we are going to not we are go go to you know out of China more and more, particularly driven by manufacturers. So how can you see companies in China? Um, best accessing the global markets, um, mitigating the risks to to that uh, um, marketplace. Even we face some, even some Chinese company face certain challenges like the Nova, TCL, and uh, others through you know acquisition. I still believe you know acquisition probably is the best way for Chinese company to go to global. Through acquisition, we can solve those branding issues, solve channel issues, also can you know, access the global uh, talents. Mm -hmm. Dick, what about that? What, what would be your recommendations in terms of Asian companies' um, best accessing capital? Well, in the first place, I think it's very difficult to see any growth uh, in any economy without the creation of a capital market. I think actually for both China and India, uh, although India at the moment seems to be ahead, uh, mostly on the equity side, less on the bond side, but both of them, I believe, in the next five to ten years will have a robust capital market. That in, uh, in itself, plus what I talked about before, with investors having the ability to move capital to the highest returning asset, uh, whether it comes in through through Hong Kong or Shanghai uh, or Mumbai, I, I do believe these two countries will be able to attract a lot of capital, especially with growth over 6, 7, 8 percent, uh, especially given what I see in the U.S. I'm glad you didn't ask me about my views on the U.S. economy. Uh, I don't quite see it in the 7, 8, 10 percent level, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Uh, so. Given the amount of overall liquidity in the marketplace, investors are clearly looking for places to put huge pools of capital. There are probably 40 different pools of capital today, well in excess of $100 billion, that, that, that need to find a safe haven. So this access to capital, whether it's around securitization, whether it's around financial products, whether it's around risk mitigation, whether it's around derivatives, swaps, the creation of a finance market, uh, a mortgage market. Uh, I think you already have private sector lending and financing in India. You have very little in China. We have to get to that. But I think in the next five to ten years, you're clearly going to see that. And the real question is, how do you, how do you harness the huge buying power of the masses. I mean, China has got huge liquidity. I mean, given, given the relative amount of average income, their savings rate is, I don't know, 35, 40 percent. I mean, that's a, that's a frightening number. Mm -hmm. uh, so they will have a tremendous amount of internally generated funds to invest. 
But again, to me, it all, it all hinges on the creation of a capital market. I think you're going to have it, and I think it's going to be huge. So let's talk as we uh, wrap up the last five minutes or so. What do you think the impact will be on the global marketplace, Azim, as we continue to see the emergence and strengthening of India and China? I think the most, the most important uh, realization that uh, developed economies must appreciate is that liberalization is a two-way traffic. And I see that very often wanting in terms of visa restrictions, restrictions in terms of trade talks, etc. I think, uh, like, like we open up our economies and our countries to them, I think uh, global uh, economies and global countries have to open up their economies uh, to global competition. And I think the severity of competition in knowledge industries is going to increase. And uh, I think uh, developed nations will have to accept the fact that uh, their people force, particularly the knowledge industry, is going to get subjected to global competition. And they will have to upgrade themselves, go up the value chain, build more productivity to be able to compete successfully. You know, I think uh, the you know, as China development, China and U.S. Is two countries will be, you know, depending on each other more and more. I think, uh, you know, you look at uh, the, the basic technology and uh, services, uh, China basically is uh, so much dependent on the United States. You know, U.S. banking is a good example. You look at all the major Chinese companies listed, they're all using, you know, U.S. bank and the U.S. lawyer accounting system, the big six accounting system, McKinsey, consulting firm, is all over in China. You know, the four telecos is very interesting. China Telecom, Earth, China Mobile, Unicom, we all using same consultant, all McKinsey. So no conflict of interest because you have no choice. Mm. And uh, I think uh, this is, uh, you know, good for, for U.S. and uh, also good chi for China. Ch you know, those uh, consulting firms, Accounting firms, lawyer, help Chinese company build international standard, and uh, as China produce more and uh, selling goods to the rest of the world, and those companies going to, you know, buy more from the United States. I think we, I'm seeing really the two countries are going to be more and more work to close together. The challenge really is China and Japan. Those two countries supposed to have so much synergy. but because of you know history issue and the political issue, the very little you know things going on between two economies. Hmm. Interesting. What about you, Nandan? What do you think as far as the impact on the global marketplace? No, I think clearly one aspect is what we talked about, is the emergence of firms from India and China that have become global players. But I think in India, given the fact that two-thirds of Indian economy is private consumer spending, I think it's also a huge market for global players in India. For example, in India today, we have a market of six million mobile phones a month, and all of them are sold by global companies like you know, uh, Motorola, Nokia, and so forth. India is a market for 200 planes, and they're being bought from firms like Boeing. So I think because of the growth of the Indian market with so many consumers, I think it's going to create a huge demand for global product, and I think that will help drive jobs and growth in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because you, the way you talk, it sounds like there's, it, it's such an open marketplace. Do you, do you worry, Edward, that, that we're actually seeing protectionism in some areas around the world? It doesn't sound like we are seeing that in India. Are, are we first, Azim? Protectionism in India? Yeah. You know, I think the one which is getting bandied a lot is the retail sector. Uh, and you know, I, I think the major concern is that we have about 21 million retailers in India. And uh, the concern is uh, particularly of the, uh, some of the alliance partners and uh, of some of the leading politicians that uh, large format stores can significantly eat into uh, the mom and pop shop stores. Uh, to an extent it's merited. For instance, Cape Cod does not permit uh, Walmart because mm -hmm. they want to preserve their heritage of small stores. Right. Uh, but, you know, an interesting format is if some of these large uh, uh, format stores like Walmart or Tesco can also consider the retailer as a customer, apart from the customer as a customer. And uh, if that model can be fairly successfully evolved, I think it, it solves some of the problems. But I think uh, retail will get uh, liberalized. It, it just from what I understand, and this is going to happen probably over the next couple of years. It will happen in stages. 
And there are a lot of areas in, in China that people believe that there are issues of protectionism. Do you worry that that could be um, a stunting of growth? I'm worried about, uh, you know, if U.S. protectionism becomes, you know, more and more strong. What's Absolutely. The That's one of China? the issues for sure. And so how do we, you know, interact between two countries? Because, you know, a large country like China, you always have two different voices. You know, one voice is want to more liberal economy, and another voice is want to more protection. And, uh, you know, those two voices, you know, fighting each other. And uh, I'm really worried about what's across, you know, Pacific and the U.S., you know, if, you know, protectionism become more and more strong, and China maybe become more, more conservative. Mm, yeah, it does, it does seem that that is the issue around the world, the United exactly. States definitely included. Dick, why don't you uh, wrap us up here and give us your take on the implications of these two economies growing as fast as they are and the impact on the global marketplace and economy? Well, both these economies, as I said, if, once they get a capital market in place, I think will really explode. Uh, let me just drop back a little bit and talk about protectionism, which I think is not good for any markets. Uh, I am basically a free marketeer, and I believe that price is one of the great, one of the great levelers. Uh, and globalization is one of the great flatteners. And it's coming. And with cell phones and Internet, uh, I think people that try to get in the way of that will just get, will just get, just get run over. And they continue to look for low-cost quality providers and those that hide behind protectionism at the end of the day will lose. And as I, I'll say it again, money flows to the highest returning asset. And that's what this global economy is about. That's what globalization is about. Uh, that's what, that's what free, free markets are about. Uh, and as I say, price is the great leveler. And with that in mind, both India and China, will they go past 10 percent? I have no idea. They have a tremendous amount of infrastructure. Uh, to build. But the real question for that is a little bit less of where we're going on that and what will be the impact of who's going to buy U.S. debt if they put so much of their money into building the infrastructure for their own countries, which is what they should be doing. I hate to leave on a question, but uh, you asked me to sum it up. That's that's one of the pieces I walk away with. But we continue to pour tremendous resources into both India and China. Uh, very simply, that's where the huge opportunities are. Gentlemen, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.